This video is going to take a look at the macromolecule proteins, the most diverse molecules on Earth, and more than 50% of all the dry mass of cells is made up of proteins. That's how many jobs that they have, that's how important that they are. One key thing that we have to remember as we proceed through not only this video but the rest of this course is structure dictates function. So the structure of proteins and structure of molecules will dictate their function and what they can do. So let's take a look at some of the protein functions that we have. One of the functions is structural support, such as cytoskeleton or connective tissue or hair or nails, things like that. Next is transporting of substances. So this could include ion channels, uh, allowing sodium and potassium in and out. This allows our nerves to function, to send impulses. Cell signaling. This could include insulin and antibodies. The body is trying to communicate from one area to another. Movement. When we want to move molecules between cells because of the semipermeable membrane, not everything can get through. So it's proteins that allow things to get through via protein channels. Coordination and regulation of activities. And this can be through shape changes. So since shape dictates the function, if the shape of the protein changes, then the function will also change. Maybe something can get through a cell membrane that couldn't before, or something is now um, yeah, trapped in or there's accelerating chemical reactions acting as a catalyst this is our example of enzymes most of the reactions in our body would happen too slowly if we didn't have protein enzymes and we would actually end up dying so pretty thankful for those proteins around our body so let's take a look at the amino acid structure this is the monomer of proteins so an amino acid we actually have 20 of them in total in our bodies. Uh, 80 of them are essential, meaning that our bodies can't synthesize and that we have to consume them. So the other 12, our body can actually synthesize and make themselves. Just for interest sake, those are the eight that are essential. The basic structure of the amino acid, there are two primary functional groups attached to it with a car central carbon in the middle. So let's take a quick look at a video on how to draw this. To draw an amino acid, start with your central carbon and then add on your functional groups. We know that there is a carboxyl group, so you start by adding the carbon, double bonded to an oxygen, and then with a hydroxyl group as well. On the other side of the carbon, we have an amino group, so draw the nitrogen attached to two hydrogens. Now, carbon needs four bonds to be considered complete or have a full outer shell, so we add another hydrogen and then we add an R representing the side chain. So since we know we have 20 amino acids, we have 20 different R groups. The rest of the amino acid molecule remains the same. It's just this R group that changes, and it's that R group that determines what the properties of that amino acid are. So those amino acid side chains can do things like making the molecule polar, nonpolar, acidic, which will actually become a negative molecule, or basic and positive, which greatly change how they interact with each other and how they interact with the environment, changing the shape, therefore changing the function. So if we take a look at some of the side chains that are nonpolar, you'll notice there are a great number of them. Nonpolar molecules, meaning that they are hydrophobic molecules. They will tend to cling and stick together. There are six polar amino acid side chains, meaning that they would prefer to be in water. They are hydro-loving or hydrophilic. And then there are also what are called the charge side chains or acidic and basic. Acidic charged side chains will be negatively charged because acids donate protons, leaving them negatively charged. And if we take a look, it's always a carboxyl group that's part of that side chain. And the basic groups always have an amino, meaning that they can attract or gain an extra proton, making them positively charged. Now, how do we go from amino acids to a protein? we have to have an anabolic reaction or a dehydration synthesis. So we take a look and we say, okay, here's our first amino acid. The carboxyl group of one amino acid will interact with the amino group of the next amino acid. So noticing this carboxyl group has already lost its hydrogen, it is a charged molecule, it will react for dehydration synthesis, meaning that water has to be produced. So we need an oxygen and two hydrogens. It's going to be the oxygen from the carboxyl group and the two hydrogens from the amino group that join to form that water molecule. 
Once they have joined, that carbon needs to bond to something and it will bond to the nitrogen. So we see that right there in that bond. That we call a peptide bond. So take a moment now, make sure you can draw this in your notes. Two amino acids joining together through a dehydration synthesis to form a peptide bond. So in dehydration synthesis, you'll get one peptide bond, but when you want to make a protein, you have a string of amino acids, so you will have multiple peptide bonds. So you can recognize them looking for the carbon bound to a nitrogen, the carbon being double bound to an oxygen, and the nitrogen bound to a hydrogen. So there's a peptide bond, and there's a peptide bond. Noticing that you end up with this backbone of amino acids with the side chains sticking out the top and the bottom or either sides of the backbone. That becomes important because as we look at that protein structure, it's the side chains that end up determining how it's going to take on that structure. So the polymers of proteins are called polypeptides because there are many peptide bonds to make a long chain of amino acids. There are actually four stages that can occur between this chain of amino acids to an actual functioning protein. The first two steps, we refer to that structure as a polypeptide because it is not yet a protein. It doesn't have a specific function. Whereas the third and the fourth steps, we will refer to it as a protein because it has a specific structure which will dictate its specific function. So let's take a look now at those four steps. So the first stage of making a protein is called the primary stage, sometimes dictated by a one with a primary symbol. It is called the sequence of amino acids. So the order of amino acids is what happens and what is important in the primary stage. This will then dictate what happens in the second, the third, and the fourth. So the second stage is called the secondary stage. And this is a result of hydrogen bonding of the peptide backbone. So that backbone that we had held together by peptide bonds will hydrogen bond together. Why? Because there are dipoles and there are hydrogens involved. It can then take two shapes, an alpha helix or a beta pleated sheet. So beta pleated sheet has these rigid folds and alpha helix has a spiral. If we want to take a look at it actually structurally, we can see that two adjacent backbones will start interacting with each other. This is a beta pleated sheet and this is an alpha helix. The tertiary or the third stage is when it actually becomes a protein. It has a three-dimensional structure, and this is due to now the side chains having interactions. And it's primarily due to the environment. Because those side chains are polar or nonpolar or acidic or basic, they are going to either group together or want to be exposed to, say, water, a polar environment. So they are going to orient themselves based on their properties. This is the tertiary or third structure where it actually becomes a functioning protein. Not all proteins have this fourth step. It's called the quaternary stage. And this is a protein that has one or more amino side chains. So this stage here, this tertiary is called a globular protein. Several of those proteins can then join together to perform a different function. This is an, uh, seen in hemoglobin, in our red blood cells. It actually has four groups together to create a functioning hemoglobin molecule. Here's an analogy that we can take a look at those four stages. Primary structure is kind of like the alphabet, all the letters. Secondary is like the words. Tertiary is like sentences. Quaternary is like paragraphs. Noticing that there's more and more and more meeting with every stage as you go on. Now, since we said that shape is so important to a protein's function, what happens if they lose their shape or denature? This is a key concept for the unit. Star it, highlight it, do whatever you need to do. So the alteration of a protein's shape will also change its function, meaning that they could no longer be able to function. Since their shape is dependent on hydrogen bonds, which are relatively weak bonds, if we change heat or pH or the salts or just mechanically mix them, those hydrogen bonds can be affected and disturbed, making it take on a different shape. So think about it, heat, you add energy, those hydrogen bonds can't hold that wiggling and jiggling of the molecules anymore. pH, well suddenly you add more positive or more negative molecules, you're going to change the interactions of those side chains. Salts, ionize, again, changing the interactions of the side chains. Mechanical agitation just literally rips those hydrogen bonds apart. We see permanent denaturing in an example of cooking an egg. So you have the native protein structure, 
begins to denature, and then you actually have the beginning of new bonds forming or cross-linking happening, meaning that it can never revert back to its original shape. There is also what is known as temporary denaturation, and we see this if you were to heat up, not boil, but just heat up warm milk. In the heat instruction, it would be an inactive protein, but it would be able to reconfigure itself. So key concept, structure and function are absolutely related to one another 